read the book, you know, you might you can hate to all you want, but you can't appreciate what he does for the story. I mean, he brings something to the table, you know? I mean, he brings a brilliantly manipulative, scheming little mind to uh, to the table in the attempt to stop Rock's, uh, uh, Rock's value quest. Now, notice something here. So, you know, Tui is simultaneously a brilliant villain, and, and at the same time, he's by far the weakest character in the universe of the story. Um, he's like a virus. A virus has no capacity for independent existence. Its very weakness is what makes it dangerous, because it has to leech onto you in order to survive. Now, every aspect of Tui's life, without exception, is devoted to gaining power over other men. And his attempt breaks down into two related subcategories. His activities, one is his, his activities as a cult leader, and two, those as a political activist for collectivism. Let's analyze these one at a time. Observe that Tui does everything he possibly can at a personal level to convince others to betray their values and to surrender their judgment to him. Tui understands that when, when people surrender their values, uh, that people like that, the Keatings, for example, uh, in the act of surrendering their values, they're surrendering their judgment, the judgment they had to they used to necessarily choose and form uh, those values. How are they going to guide their lives once having given up uh, both the effect and the cause? How are they going to guide their lives once they've given up, one, what, they, what they is most important to them, and two, the means by which they identify which is most important to them? The brutal answer is that they cannot. They no longer possess a capacity of internal guidance and require constant guidance from an external source. And notice that too is always there. Ayn Rand makes it clear in that's those those background chapters where he was uh, he was a vocational advisor at some New York college, whether it's you know, say whether it was NYU or Columbia, whatever. whatever. But he was a vocational advisor, and uh, he always urged these young his young proteges away from the career choices and the romantic relationships that they they want. Um, and uh, Iron Man says, you know, he was never too busy. Years later, they come back and they clung to him. And you know, he was never too busy to give them, uh, you know, his undivided attention. It just kind of makes you feel kind of warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? Oh, what a great guy he is, Uncle Ellsworth. He's always there for some. Yeah. Well, after he crippled them, um, he's there to, uh, you know, help them hobble down the street. Um, after he's emptied their soul, he's there to fill it. Uh, with whatever he wants. And think of it this way. This is the way I always explain to my students. Uh, let's say, for example, what you want out of life is, is you want to you be an MD and you want to practice medicine, let's say, in San Francisco. Beautiful city. A lot of kooks out there, but beautiful city. Uh, and uh, uh, in pursuit of your own values, then you guide your own life. Right? You, you, need, you have to go to college, study biology, do well. You have to apply to medical schools, got to move to San Francisco, etc. In pursuit of your own values, you are the guide of, of your life. Uh, once Tui gets these people to give up what they want out of life, they can no longer guide their own lives. What do they say? Nature permits no vacuums? And this is as true in psychology as it is in physics. Uh, people still, they're still alive, they still need to make career choices, romantic choices, etc. But they've given up their values, their, their soul is empty, has to be filled. And Tui's always there to fill it you know, externally, to fill it with what he wants to be there. Notice, um, notice that Tui, and Ayn Rand was writing this in the late 30s, early 40s. Notice that at one level, Tui is a, uh, a, a contemporary cult leader. He's, he's like Jim Jones or David Koresh or Sun Young Moon. He's somebody who acquires an army of followers who uh, obey him implicitly. Remember the way she describes Hopton Stoddard? That Stoddard uh, regarded Tui on earth as he expected to regard God in heaven? They follow Tui. At one point, Alvis Garrett says to Tui, 
what about your followers? And Tui says, oh dear, my followers, I have so many followers, I've brushed them out of my hair. <laughs> well, that's true, he does. And this is Tui at the, at the personal level, at the individual level, Tui the, Tui the cult leader. And I think it's important to note that in the character of Ellsworth Tui, created in, in the 1930s, Ayn Rand uh, predicted the rise of cults roughly a quarter of a century later, uh, you know, uh, before they rose to prominence in, in American society. And the reason for such prescience goes to the very theme of the book. If uh, under the influence of the, the, the Kantian philosophy, the modern philosophy that, so that society is dominant, Americans are becoming less independent and more like Peter Keating, willing, eager to bow down before the group and the leaders of the group, then they will in, in, inexorably begin following in droves such uh, cult leaders as Ellsworth too. A society of, uh, in, uh, which has increasing number of cognitive and psychological dependents are uh, poor lost souls searching, screaming for a leader. As what did Iron Man once said that the, the new left, she once described the new left and the hippies. I don't remember the exact words. I just remember something like they were, they were poor lost soul searching for a Fuhrer, you know, so, you know for, for somebody to, to, to fill their empty lives with meaning that they could then follow blindly. Um, uh, now, that's too we get the, at the level of his personal power seeking, his, 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 uh, his acquisition of this, this private army of followers. But Tui is also a Marxist intellectual, preaching socialism to the masses, uh, and was modeled after, what was that guy's name, was it Harold Lasky, was that his name? The English, hmm? Uh, was, yeah, I think he was, I think he was an English, he was an English professor, we can look it up in, uh, in the notes to the novel, I think, it was, I think it was Harold Lasky, he was a British, uh, he was a socialist, I can't remember, um, I, remember, I don't remember if he was a politician or, or a professor, it doesn't matter, but uh, Ayn Rand modeled the character of Tui after this, you know, 1930s uh, British socialist. And um, uh, Tui, notice that Tui preaches Marxism to the masses. She says in, in the Fountainhead, you know, w like once a month he devoted his column in the banner, One Small Voice, to architecture. And the rest of the month it was daily column, as I remember. The rest of the month it was Ellsworth Tui preaching socialism to the masses. Uh, now, Tui's support of socialism is a related source of power seeking. By means of his columns, his books, his speeches, he's attempting to establish a communist style dictatorship in America. And he makes clear to Keating in his confession speech at the end what his own role in such a state will be. Tui will be the intellectual advisor behind the throne. Tui is not a political strongman of the Hitler or Stalin variety. He's not the bloodthirsty thug who's actually going to be out in the street breaking heads or commanding his secret police to be out in the street breaking heads. Uh, Tui's the intellectual advisor behind the throne. He's the intellectual whose theories are necessary to morally justify the policies of a collectivist state. Notice that political leaders will get their, uh, their advisors out of the universities. And um, communism, which say what you will about its brutality, they murdered 100 million people in 80 years, um, but communism is an ideology. It's not, like, it's not like Nazism, which is a gut level, visceral feeling. Um, communism is an ideology, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entire philosophy. Uh, you know, Marx is uh, Das Kapital, and behind Marx, of course, Hegel. And, and notice that the, the Nazis never attracted, or not, not never, rarely attracted intellectuals. At, some, at one time in Germany, they did in the, in, the, in the 30s. But the Nazis rarely attracted intellectuals. The Nazis galvanized the, the masses. You know, the uneducated, unwashed, because they can relate to race, you know, race war. Um, but the Marxists, the irony here is the Marxists who claim to speak for the masses, for the, for the uh, workers, for the exploited uh, industrial factory workers, the Marxists have never been popular amongst the workers. They attract their followers from, from this quote, the intelligentsia. The intellectuals are Marxists. I'll never forget the great example of that is the 1970s, the Vietnam War. 
You know, you know, there's these Columbia kids from wealthy families studying sociology or philosophy at Columbia University, burning the American flag, and these hard hat construction workers from Brooklyn, you know, who maybe maybe went to high school, beat the hell out of these kids for burning the American flag. Um, there's the class struggle went awry somewhere for the for the Marxists, where you have the the working class supporting America and capitalism, and the wealthy class, uh, the science of the wealthy class supporting the Soviet Union, you know, and and, and communism. Um, so your Marxism is is an intellectual theory, however false it may be. It's a philosophy. It's a philosophical system, and communist leaders. Uh, require intellectuals to, you know, interpret uh, how socialism, what socialism means, how socialism is, is to be implemented, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And there's Tui's place in the communist dictatorship that he seeks to uh, impose. He is the intellectual advisor behind the throne. Uh, so Tui understands that intellectual leadership is his role. That the dictator, the Stalin, the Pol Pot, the Mao, uh, that the dictator physically controls the people, and two, he intellectually controls the dictator. He makes policy for the state, and the dictator imposes it. Now, these two forms of power lusting are intimately related. It's his power lusting at the personal level, and his power lusting at the social. Because two, he understands. No communist system can be imposed on a society of Howard Rock type individualists. The Howard Rock types are going to create and support uh, a system like the American system. In fact, they did. Because <laughs> who the founding fathers were the Jeffersons, the Franklins, the Madisons. They were the Howard Rocks of, uh, of the American Enlightenment of the 18th century. Uh, so, America, with its heritage of independence and individual rights, still gives birth to men like Rourke, like Dominic Frank and Austin Hell or Steve Mallory, Roger Enright. In real life, it still attracts people like Ayn Rand uh, from Russia or from wherever. Um, and therefore, America presents a much greater challenge to the collectivists than, say, Germany or Russia or China. I mean, Germany has this whole, Hitler cashes in on this in Mein Kampf, this whole history of tribal uh, self-sacrifice that you, 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 you sacrifice for the for the people in German, the folk. In Russia, similarly, very collectivist tribal society. Also in Asia, you know, in, in China, the collectivists of those societies had a much easier time imposing uh, communism. But American communists, they're fighting an uphill struggle. I mean, America, it was not founded on those principles. America was founded on, on 18th century enlightenment principles of, of individualism, individual rights, what they call the, the rights of man. So Tui knows, uh, Tui knows in, in order to inculcate uh, political collectivism, the, the idea that the society is preeminent, the individual exists to serve the state, uh, he must antecedently inculcate psychological dependence. In, in order to have political dependency rather than political independence, you need psychological dependence. You, 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 in order to have a big brother state, you need people who are willing to give their lives to big brother in return for big brother, you know, using the term from 1984. Uh, and, uh, you, you need to have a society of people willing to obey and willing to, uh, want, or eager to have uh, the state take, take care of them. Now, remember, the, the, the attraction to communism, the attraction to communism has always been, you know, for, for the pe whatever people have been attracted to it, is you, you're taken care of by the state. Right, you're born in a state-controlled nursery, you're, you're, you're educated in state-controlled schools, you live in state-controlled housing, you work in state-controlled factories or farms, uh, you, re you retire to state-controlled nursing homes. This cradle-to-grave maintenance the, 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 the state provides, uh, that, that's always, been, that's always been, the, been, been the attraction. Now, of course, the Howard, the Howard Rourke types have no interest in that. They don't, they, they, don't, they don't want to be taken care of by the state. They want to take responsibility for their own lives. And they're certainly not going to obey. So Tui knows that he needs to uh, generate a society of Peter Keating types, a society of people who want to be taken care of by the state and who are very willing to obey the state. And that's, hence, with every individual that Tui, the cult leader, uh, persuades to blindly follow him, 